morning. Um, this is going to be the last installment of these for the week, because uh, I'm going to take the weekend off. I might continue this next week, I don't know. Um, this is kind of a test, just to kind of see what the outlay, you know, the actual like amount of effort would be required to do this kind of thing, i.e. record a video. It turns out it takes about an hour, you know, 10 minutes to record, 20 to chop out the really boring and annoying stuff, and then another 20 to screw with YouTube, it's basically, and then, you know, maybe another rewatch in there. So, yeah, about an hour. Um... What was I going to talk about today? What was I thinking about? Um, I was thinking about the sort of fundamental cleavage in the sort of modality of effectively product development versus marketing. Product development or just, you know, doing production, making whatever it is that is useful in the world versus telling people about it. Like, really is kind of, it really kind of reduces, actually, there's a Druckerism that's kind of like all business, it's just marketing and innovation, that's two, two things that, uh, it, everything, everything that, a, every function that a business can do reduces to those two things, that's the better formulation. I'm sorry, it's... 6.51 a.m., so I'm a little groggy still, but, um, yeah, it's, I recall somebody, when I was thinking about this aloud, I recall somebody coming after me for the marketing, something about everything reduces to marketing, it's like, are you kidding me, you know, sales and marketing are always at each other's throats because of the resources, like, the salespeople are like, oh, well, all we, just give us, you know, we'll hire some more people and we'll go out and and sell shit versus the marketing people will be like, oh no, we'll have a campaign, etc. And they're always competing with resources. And it's like, sure, that, that fine. You know, that's called a business. But when you're talking about a conceptual model, <laughs> like it's, it's a little bit different. Um, you know, I think it's actually very helpful to think about how any kind of business or any kind of enterprise reduces to uh, you're either making the thing or you're telling people about the thing. And it's like, when you look at the annual reports, it's really actually kind of interesting when you look at the annual reports of, like, pharma companies or, like, the Coca-Cola company or whatever, and it's like, you know, we spend uh, 70% of our operating capital on marketing and 30% on product. Like, it's, you know, because, like, you can't, you know, you're, it's only in the rarest case that your production functions has a dual function as as, as marketing material. Um, as for the word innovation, it's funny because you know, in the, in the literature, it's treated like a kind of first order thing. You know. Uh, politicians are always like, oh, you have more innovation. It's like, but they don't actually know what that means. I remember actually hearing some kind of, it was like a bureaucrat of some kind, some government person talking about how, dis, like talking about the word disruption, like that was an inherently good thing. And it's like, <laughs> dude, you're the government. Like you don't know. Disruption is like eminently bad. You're, you're, you're the whole reason why you exist is to like curb disruption to make disruption not a thing. But anyway, I digress. Um, you know, another sort of Druckerism uh, around innovation was sort of an anecdote about the guy who sells um, refrigerators to Inuit. And it's like, oh, well, they're Inuit, what do they need refrigerators? Well, it turns out that the insulation in refrigerators works in both directions, and, like, you can actually keep them, you know, you can... Uh, use them to keep food from getting too cold. Um, and the, the the take home there was like, here's a thing that you just like you can appropriate it and you can use it for a different use and there's going to be value coming out of that. Um, and you know, I don't know, innovation. 
it's like uh, it's like innovation in contrast to invention. Like you don't have to invent anything to innovate. You just have to, you know, think about a a, a new application for whatever the hell it is that you're doing. Um, in contrast with invention, like you can invent something by accident. Uh, but you always innovate on purpose. And I think that's kind of an interesting characteristic of it. But I'm also reminded of, there's a paper by Bill Nordhaus, who, you know, he was the guy who won the Nobel in economics, well, Nobel in economics, for um, this like that really awful paper that says like global warming might be okay actually um but he wrote as well this paper that is it's called Schumpeterian profits and the alchemist fallacy and it's something that i think about a lot because it describes this kind of scenario about what happens when you do, well, like when inventing stuff is your job. Um, because, well, first of all, I mean, to characterize like what a Schumpeter, I mean, Joseph Schumpeter is the creative destruction guy. I mean, he was, he's like way dead. But um, the idea of a Schumpeterian profit is a profit, like something that, you, that, that just gets you like so freaking much return of um and it's you it's almost always going to have to be some kind of invention um it gets you so much return but then like um it eventually like peters out like it kind of like plateaus off and, and and what have you and then the the argument is kind of like that um that and the, this is where the alchemist fallacy comes in is that the so the idea of an alchemist is like you know i can turn lead into gold or whatever it's like okay so you find out how to turn lead into gold you keep that a secret but it's like oh fuck i've got all this gold um and people keep wanting to steal it they want to steal the, the gold they want to steal the secret of how to make the gold i'm out going out buying things with all the gold and like as I do that, like I'm spending gold. So like more people out there have gold. So the actual gold that I'm making is like lowering in value as I do that. And then furthermore, like I've got to hire bodyguards and I got to get buy security systems and whatever to like make sure that nobody comes and steals the, the gold or the gold making secret. And like in that process, you're also spending gold for them. Right. And like they go out and they spend their gold. And so the actual, the, the, your, your secret of making gold becomes less and less valuable over time. And that was kind of an allegory for talking about um, intellectual property and like how there's obviously value in policing the intellectual property, like to some extent, like you might want to make sure that like, you know, people aren't ripping you off or whatever, but like it immediately, like it very quickly goes into diminishing returns and especially like, uh, and he sort of posited like that, you know, of the total value created, there's maybe, you know, you might be able to capture 5% of that. And the other 95% goes to the people who buy your product. They buy like the, like, like the value is actually being enjoyed by the people who bought your stuff. And, um, and you can, you can try to capture more of that. You might be able to double your 5% to 10%, but like how aggressively you're going to have to police, um, your intellectual property or police the usage or whatever is, um, you know, it goes up exponentially versus the actual, uh, benefits that you get out of it. So your benefits are going to go up linearly. And the cost is going to go up uh, exp or non-linear, at least it might be quadratic or something like that, um, versus versus the the benefit of uh, getting you know more of the piece of the pie from your invention. So I mean, I think about that a lot. I think about that. That is like always on my mind. Um, but I'm going to take the weekend off. I may come back on Monday. 
and I'm going to finish my coffee.